All right, I guess let's get started, eh? It's really good to be back here at Stir Trek. Every time I come to Stir Trek, I feel like I'm reconnecting with my tribe. Have you ever built a gadget or a gizmo or a thingamabob and then had troubles changing its configuration? Maybe you went from a dev environment to production and you need to change Wi-Fi credentials. Or maybe you have a robot that you want to just drive around in real time. Or maybe you need to change the set point of your mash pot on your experimental microbrewery. Well, I was in that exact predicament with a gadget that I'd made. I despaired of ever finding a good solution until I remembered about .NET MAUI. MAUI is the Microsoft's multi-platform application user interface framework. It helps you build apps for multiple platforms from a single code base. That means one solution targeting Android, Windows, iOS, Tizen. I'll be working with the Microsoft tool chain in this session, which means Visual Studio 2022 Community Edition and Visual Studio Code. Now, if you want to see Maui development with the Apple ecosystem, then absolutely check out Sam Basu's talk this afternoon, Open Source XAML Takes You Places, at 1 p.m. in Sith. Now, if you're more familiar with uh, web development, you might want to corner Heath Murphy or Sam Basu and talk to them about PWAs and Blazor WebAssembly. Heath gave a talk this morning about the death of mobile apps. Well, we're going to show him. By the end of the session, I hope you have ideas for ways to control your own gadgets and the confidence to try out that development with .NET MAUI. My gadget is made from a Raspberry Pi Pico W, a Pi Maroni Pico Unicorn Pack, and the MicroPython Runtime. The Pico W is a dual core microcontroller with uh, two megabytes of flash memory, 264 kilobytes of RAM, uh, Wi Fi radio, and a Bluetooth radio. It also has the GPIOs and all that other wonderful good stuff. The unicorn display is a 7 by 16 matrix of RGB goodness. And the firmware is the MicroPython runtime provided by Pymeroni, and it includes support for all their products. Altogether, they make up the Conway's Game of Life gadget. In the first version of the Game of Life gadget, the state machine initial state, or its seed, is hard-coded as a Python dictionary literal. Changing the seed requires starting up your computer, firing up an editor, changing the source code, uploading it to the microcontroller, rebooting the microcontroller, ugh. Let's change how we configure a seed. We'll make it a named list of tuples instead of a dictionary. So we have a list of XY pairs. The state machine has a load method, which will take this and load it into the state machine and start it running. This isn't much better than the previous method, but it does give us a couple of advantages. We can store many seeds in a Python module and then access them by name. And the load method allows us to take a properly formatted string as a seed. Do those lists need to be hard-coded into the app? Well, of course not. Since the Pico W has a Wi-Fi radio, how about we use that? We'll install some third-party code to make it our lives easier. I, I used WWMLAM or I'm sorry, MMWLAN uh, for accessing uh, the Wi-Fi network. And then I used Microdot uh, for a web server. To configure the gadget, we'll just, take, we'll just post some information to the, the web server on the microcontroller, and away we go. Now, even with my awesome web skills and keen sense of design, 
this solution to the configuration problem isn't any easier than it was before. We still need to provision Wi-Fi on the microcontroller, which means hard-coding the SSID and the password. We need to know the URL of the web server, and the user interface is ugly. How about the other radio? It comes with two, let's use Bluetooth. First, we need to get Bluetooth running on the Pico W. We have two options here. We can do it ourselves, or we can use a library. Since we want to succeed, we're going to go with option number two. The MicroPython repository on GitHub has plenty of example code that will give you a start with the potentially mind-boggling amount of information about hacking Bluetooth. We'll use the Nordic UART service for this project. It provides a two-way channel for text data. I copied two files from the repo into my project because I may not know all the ins and outs of Bluetooth and MicroPython, but I do know how to read code. When looking at example code to determine what to incorporate into a project, I have two criteria, and that's simplicity and pragmatism. It's hard to argue with it works. Actually using the module is simple. First, we'll define a receive callback. This callback saves the received object uh, so that the gadget will use it when it boots up the next time. It loads the received list of tuples into the state machine. Next, we instantiate a Bluetooth object. This also starts advertising so that the gadget will be visible to Bluetooth scanning. And finally, we'll set the services callback. Now, if you need more functionality of your, out of your UART connection, take a look at the BLE UART REPL example in the MicroPython code base. We want the gadget to continue blinking as well as respond to Bluetooth events. There's a couple of ways to do this. Preemptive multitasking or co cooperative multitasking. Both have a set of processes or tasks that need to be scheduled by the scheduler. The difference is how the scheduler regains control from the process. In a preemptive scheduler, a process is interrupted by the scheduler and then control passed to the next process. Since the scheduler has to interrupt the process at any point in its execution, the scheduler needs to manage the process's state. Another way of doing it is cooperative multitasking or using a cooperative scheduler. In a cooperative scheduler, it's up to the process to release control when it's in a valid state. The scheduler doesn't need to manage so much state and can be simpler. It's very good when you have a microcontroller with 264 KB of RAM. MicroPython provides a cooperative multi-scheduling environment in the form of the async I.O. library, and that may just be Python too, wouldn't it? Okay, so we have Python up and running on our Bluetooth device. Are we sure? Is it actually running? Is it actually working? How can we test it without writing the entire app? Well, I downloaded an app named Serial Bluetooth Terminal. It opens a connection to a Bluetooth LE device and then sends and receives text with that device. It has a, this one has a handy macro function, and I just assigned uh, some Python source code to these named macros, and I can connect to my Bluetooth device, send the string, and see the change on my device. It's a really good way of uh, testing your proof of concept. Now, while testing the program, I found that there are a number of macros that didn't seem to be working properly. Uh, the longer macros were getting truncated. I just decided to buffer the information until I had a complete string and then send it off to the device. So that's what we're going to be writing an application for, to handle this Bluetooth configuration. So far, we have a gadget made with a Raspberry Pi Pico W, 
a way of set configurations over Bluetooth, a mechanism to persist configuration across reboots, and a tool to make sure it's all working properly. Next, we'll look at the Android app we'll build to configure the gadget, which is why we're here. Let's get an idea of what we want to build. A ballpoint in a napkin is a really good way to wireframe uh, or to, to yeah, wireframe your app. You can also use Balsamic or Pencil, any of those tools. You could also just crack open Visual Studio and start writing an app. But it's still a good idea, once you get a feel for the environment, to go back and kind of map out where you want your app to go. Our app is going to have two screens. The seeds screen is going to give a list of seeds and a button to edit the seed and then a way of sending the seed to the device. The devices screen manages the Bluetooth connection and it provides button for scanning for available devices and connecting to a specific device. Like I mentioned, we'll be using Visual Studio 2022 Community Edition to build the mobile app. Because I have an Android phone and not an iPhone, I'm going to be concentrating on Android. Uh, if you want to build for iPhone, there's tutorials out there to help you. So fire up Visual Studio Installer and install the multi-platform app UI development workload. After installing that workload, launch Visual Studio and create a MAUI app. The new solution has example code and links for documentation and tutorials. Now, I don't know about you, but if I fire up uh, some example code, I like to see if it actually compiles. So we're going to hit the F5 key, or the Run button, and see the example running under the Microsoft Windows machine target. It's nice that the example compiles and runs, but that doesn't really get us to the multi-promise of multi-platform. So there are some tasks we need to do uh, before we can debug our app. First, we need to make sure that the Android SDK is installed. So from the Tools menu, select Android SDK Manager, and make sure you have the SDK and emulator installed. Next, you want to go up to the Tools menu and find Android Device Manager, create an emulator. This is just uh, with the default values. And then start the emulator. Next, we need to Andro enable the Android target in the property sheet of the project. And second, since we're going to be sideloading this app, we need to set the release bundle format to APK. So select the emulator that you created earlier from the runtime download there. Hit the Run button. And marvel at our multi-platform app. Finally, we get to the whole point of this session. And that is multi-platform development with Maui and .NET. So I'll be concentrating on describing the features uh, that I used to build this tool for my gadget and in some of the places where I stumbled. Remember the Maui default project welcome screen had a lot of good links there to information on how to program in .Maui, both from Microsoft and from third parties. Just as we depended on third-party code in the gadget side of things, we're going to use third-party code here in the mobile app. The first one is the plugin.ble, which is available on NuGet. That's going to provide access to the hardware, the Bluetooth hardware that we're going to manipulate. And these SQLite packages are going to give us on-device relational, relational store for our seeds. Here's what we're going to cover in the rest of the talk. MVVM, dependency injection, XAML, navigation, services, oh, hardware, debugging on the metal, deploying to Android. 
That seems like a long list, so let's be about it. The model view, view model pattern splits functionality between into loosely coupled classes to provide better testability and maintainability of an app. In a large commercial application, you want to use the MVVM pattern for just those reasons. Now, if you look at the Solution Explorer, uh, for this project, you won't see a folder called View Models. Like all patterns in software development, MVVM works best when there's a reason to use it. Our application here is very simple. So I'm going to dispense with that complexity and just use the code behind model. Each view consists of a XAML file and a C sharp file, one defining the look and the other defining the behavior of a particular screen. The XAML file binds to properties and event handlers process user interactions. Now, if you decide to use the MVVM pattern for your app, then you'll want to use the MVVM community toolkit, also available on NuGet. Many of the examples that you find on Stack Overflow are going to be using that toolkit, which is a big plus, and you'll see how the toolkit helps to manage the complexity inherent in the MVVM model. Before getting into XAML, let's uh, look at interfacing the app with uh, your mobile device. Your phone has a bunch of hardware on it. It has uh, location, it has sensors, it has audio, video, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi. We need a way to interact. We need software to interact with this hardware. That software we're going to bundle up into a class, in this case, BLE Manager. Now, there's a couple of ways we can get the BLE Manager into the code behind file for our page where it can be used by the page for, you know, stuff. One of those ways is we can just instantiate the BLE Manager within the constructor of the page. The other way we can do this is pass an instance of BLE Manager into the page constructor as an argument. This leads to tightly coupled code. In the second example, oh, there we go. So we don't want instance creation to be mucking about in our code behind file. We'll inject it into the app using dependency injection. The magic of automatically passing objects is called, uh, is provided by something called an inversion of control container. This breaks the coupling between the device page and the BLE manager and allows for better maintainability and a cleaner code base. So how do we invoke this sweet, sweet magic? The MAUI program class is the entry point of your app and is created as part of the solution template. Now we register the types of the service classes in the container. Here we're telling the container that whenever a Bluetooth manager is, uh, is required, we're going to use a singleton instance that we've already created. So every time we need a Bluetooth manager, we'll use the same instance. We can also register transient objects. In this case, the container will create a new instance of the seed edit page every time one is required. Now, the seed edit page will use instances of dependencies that were injected earlier. So, in this example, uh, the database. Extensible, markup extensible application markup language, or XAML, is how we describe the user interface of our, the application. A XAML element describes either a layout or a view. Properties on these elements uh, define the visual details of the element, uh, they define child elements, uh, and they bind values to the underlying page instance. So a layout determines how items are positioned uh, on the screen. So a stack layout will position elements in a single column or a single row. A grid layout positions things based on row and column identifiers. And a canvas just gives you something to, run, to draw on. Views, on the other hand, are the actual components that the user interacts with. 
If you had a really long list of items to display, you might put a collection view inside of a scroll view. Your collection view might lay out the properties of each item in a grid, and uh, then that is going to use a label view to actually display the values. The hierarchical nature of XAML might make you wish for a visual designer, and that tool is called Blender. It's uh, included in some of the Visual Studio workloads. It's really geared more for animations, the desktop, and uh, universal Windows program development, but it is available with the Community Edition. A simple app such as this doesn't really need uh, a visual designer. Uh, the hot XAML reload functionality makes it really easy to tweak your UI. XAML tends to be very dense, so it looks more complicated than it actually is. There's a lot of information on screen you have to, to look at, um, but it doesn't take long to figure it all out. So every XAML file is going to have a corresponding c -sharp file, the code behind. It's going to contain the actual code that is run when the user interfaces or interacts with the application. Properties hold values that the XAML will bind to for display. Properties can be scalars or objects or collections. Event handlers are invoked when the user interacts with the app and light or whenever lifecycle events occur. Service references are instances of classes that provide persistence, validation, business logic. The code behind file is where services are injected by the IOC container. Navigation. The MAUI shell contains a URI-based navigation mechanism. It uses routes to go from one page to the next. Using XAML, you define a tab bar. In this case, we have two tabs, seeds and devices. Other routes are registered the same way. This is the route for the seed edit page. When you click on the little button over there on the right, the event handler for that button will call shell.current.goToAsync with the seed as a parameter, and your edit page will come up. Now, the BLE manager class that I've talked about earlier controls scanning, connecting, disconnecting from the gadget over the Bluetooth radio, as well as sending data to the, the gadget. That's not the hard part. In fact, with the amount of example code on the web, it's pretty easy to take those examples and bend them to your will and mold them into the shape of an app that you're looking for. The hardest part <laughs> was getting the permissions correct. It seemed like every Stack Overflow post or blog entry listed a different set of permissions that were required to get Bluetooth working. Here's the secret. Bookmark the developer documentation for whatever platform you're looking at. In my case, the Android developer uh, documentation gave me an exact list of the require of the permissions I needed to be able to scan. Once I added those into my app, I was able to scan for my gadget. Whew. Okay. So the emulator, when you're debugging your code, the emulator gives you access to a lot of bits and pieces of the emulated device. You've got uh, mapping, camera, audio, all kinds of things. But what it doesn't give you is any way to emulate Bluetooth functionality. So that whole BLE manager, we can't test that to see if it's working properly. So how are we going to do that? We are going to debug on the metal. We're going to, instead of building a distribution, copying the APK file over to the device, 
installing, loading, running, determining that something doesn't work and go back, we're going to tether our device to Visual Studio and debug on an actual device. Oh, got ahead of myself. To do that, we have to prepare the device. We have to put it into developer mode. So navigate to your uh, software information, tap seven times on build number, and you will activate developer mode. Navigate back to the settings, and select developer options, and enable USB debugging. After plugging your device into a USB port, you should be able to select that device from the targets menu, hit F5, and debug the code as it's running on the device. Here I've set a breakpoint at the device detected handler, and you can see I've hit the great breakpoint, and my device is happily waiting for me to continue. Now, up till now, we've been working in the development environment. It's time to put our app onto a device so that we can actually use it when we are out and about in the real world. To do that, we need to build a release, publish it, distribute it, sign it, copy it to the device, and install. First, we'll build a release. Select Release from the Solution menu, and then Build from the menu. Next, we need to package the release into a format that we can transfer to our mobile device. Selecting Publish from the menu will package up the code into an APK file. Click the Distribute button to bring up the Channel Selection dialog. Now, because the package format is APK, uh, the ad hoc button is highlighted. If you want to distribute over Google Play, you need to change the package format to bundle in those project properties. Finally, we need to sign the package. So create a signing identity by hitting the big plus button. After saving the file, we'll actually sign it, and you can put in the password here. We're almost there. Copy the signed APK to your mobile device, navigate to your downloads folder, open the APK file. Now, right here, if you get a bad format exception from the installer, it just means you're trying to install an unsigned package. Make sure that you copy the file from the signed APKs folder. Once the app finishes installing, click Open, and you'll be running your app. So we've covered a lot of ground this morning. Screenshots and GIFs don't actually give you an idea of what it's like to build an app with Maui. So you know what that means. It's demo time. As it turns out, the buttons on the configuration app that navigate to the, sc to the edit screen are small. A lot of times I would want to edit a seed, but I wouldn't hit the button quite correctly, and I'd send that seed to the device. Another problem is that we check the Bluetooth permissions when we start scanning. That's not a problem in itself, but it is kind of jarring uh, the first time it happens, because the assumption is once you install the app, it should be ready for use. So we're going to move that initial check to when the app first comes up so that the user will open the app, configure it, and then start to use it. It's a subtle difference, but it can make it nicer for your users. OK, so we're going to do this like that. And now we're going to go over here, whoops, like that. And let's bring up this fella right here, Groovy. All right, and go over to Exclusion Explorer. We're going to change the buttons first. So let me run, start this running.
Do, 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 do. Are there any questions? Comments? Yes? Okay, great. Yeah, thanks for using the Discord. So, um, first question is, you added the VLE manager as a singleton. Is there a reason that it's a singleton? Is it uh, locking the hardware? Is it only one able to use the radio at a time? Why did I make it a singleton? Because it's... Um, why did I make it a singleton? It seemed to work, for one. Um, I assumed when I started it that there would probably be some sort of state that I would need to manage over that Bluetooth connection, and I wanted to reuse that information. So uh, that's really the reason you would use the, a singleton. If you, if you needed to reuse this information across uh, each time that you would use the, that particular service. It probably, if I, if I look deeper yeah. into Bluetooth, I'm sure that would be something I would want to do at a, some point in the future. Uh, the question was, why did you use a singleton for the BLE manager when you were registering? No, that is the emulator, um, okay. and I didn't search very far for it, to tell you the truth. I looked at the list of things that it had, and I didn't see a Bluetooth icon, which led me to believe that there is no Bluetooth on the emulator, and that's why I dove into the debugging on the metal. So we're going to actually use the Bluetooth on the device to debug it, and as you, can, as you saw, it hits breakpoints, it's really pretty cool. You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> that question is, was, is the lack of Bluetooth a function of your environment or a function of the emulator? And it was because it's not in the emulator. Here we have, whoa, the application <laughs> running uh, in a debugger in the emulator. And right here, we have the XAML source code for this seeds page. What we're going to do right here, I'm, whoops, uh, let's go up here. I'm going to change this from an image button. We're going to use a different view. We're going to change that to be a button, which makes this particular piece of information incorrect. And button dot image source. So we're going to, instead of using text to fill in the button, we're going to use an image. And why are you... Uh, there we go. You just saw an example of hot XAML reload. If you look over on the right-hand side, those buttons are now button buttons and not simply a teeny tiny icon. We're going to change the size of it, I-U-M. Let's change the color of the, let's change that to white. Hot XAML Reload. It allows you to tweak your UI. It's very cool. Now then, I wonder what was, what was the next bit here. Oh, yes, we were going to change where we are going to uh, check for uh, that first check for the Bluetooth permissions. So we'll go down here. We are in the seed list page. This is the code behind. Oops, there we go. This is the code behind for, this, for the XAML that we just saw. Unnavigated to is one of the life cycle events. So every time you go to this page, you pull this up, it's going to run this code. So we've already injected our Bluetooth manager. And check and request access. All righty. And now, 
Uh, we're going to have, oh, nope, come on back here. All right. Tools, Android, SD, no, device manager. Yes, blah, blah, blah. Okay, we're going to stop the device. Whoop, dang it. Stop the device. Do a factory reset so that it forgets that I've already been prompted for per permissions. We'll start it up again. And uh, da, 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 debug. Now, we've re it just rebuilt the code because I've changed some of the code behind. When it starts up, come on, there you go. Thank you. Any more questions? Uh, if you're adding questions to the uh, Discord, I will be monitoring that all day. If you have other, something pops up in your head, and I'll answer them as soon as I can. But it is Stir Trek. There's a lot of neat stuff going on. But I will get to it. All right. Why are we not? And here I thought making sure it was plugged in would make things a little quicker. This is only because we stopped and restarted the emulator. All those earlier changes should still be here. Okay, emulator started. Okay, well, at least it found the device. Yeah, there we go. Waiting for debugger. Okay, first access to the seed list page now. There it is. The seed list page just loaded up. It's the first time it's been run. The first thing we do then is check permissions and get access to the code. So now let's try something really bizarro. Let's try to edit something. Whoa! Something broke. OK, well. Show call stack down here sometime in native code. Da, 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 da. Okay, we're going to have to guess then. Since we just clicked on the button, I suspect it has something to do with the button handler. So let's go back to the seed list page. We'll find the button handler. Uh, edit. Ah, we changed an image button to a button button, so we need to change the cast. No worries. Let's see. This should crash it finally. And now we're going to run it again. It should load up faster this time because all we did was a little bit of change here. The emulator's already running, been in, in, uh, initialized. Bada bing. Bada boom. And it's working. So that's what it's like to build a mobile app using .NET MAUI. You don't need a big fancy designer. Hot XAML reload just allows you to tweak the UI. Debugging the, the functionality is uh, a breeze because of the Visual Studio's just wonderful debugging environment. All right, so let's go back here. And like this, I'll be darned. I love it when technology works. <laughs> so there's still a lot more in the, in the Maui ecosystem. 
we didn't cover things like sharing resources across views using resource dictionaries, um, advanced binding paths, changing icons and colors, or uh, we didn't cover you know, local data persistence. That being said, don't worry about it. If you can identify the business end of a soldering iron, then you have what it takes to build multi-platform mobile apps using Maui for configuring your gadget. Start with some sample code and mold it into what you need. Pretty soon you'll be driving your microbrewery rover around the block and your neighbors won't know what to think. So thanks for coming to my session. I really appreciate it. And I'll see you around. Uh, don't be afraid to stop me in the halls if you want to see an actual demonstration uh, on the phone with a device. Come talk to me. Thanks a lot for coming. Ah, are there any questions? It's, uh... Absolutely. Let me bring back up uh, Visual Studio and we'll go over that. The question is, how does .NET MAUI handle the multi-platform piece? There we go. Up here. Oh, we'll stop. The, eh, we'll leave the debugger. Go back to the Solution Explorer. Right here in under Platforms, There we go. You'll find a directory, a folder for each of the different platforms. And in my case, uh, hacking for Android, I have this. This contains some resources. Uh, the activity activity is a Android mobile app idea. I did have to make, let me see, where is it? Ah, Android platform helper. I had to make one C-sharp class within this folder to support Android. And this is where you get your check and request Bluetooth permissions. Ah, there's the permissions. You would have comparable information bundled up under the iOS or the Windows or the Tizen platform folders. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. That's correct. Yep. Uh, mainly because uh, different platforms have different ways of doing things. And uh, even though we're managing the entire project with multiple platforms from a single code base, not all of that code is going to be used for each and every platform. Okay, multiple targets, yeah. Um, anything else then? Yes, sir. Um, so is that the, the, the pie on your, on your badge there? Yes. Oh. Yeah, this is, this is the gadget that I'm talking about right here. Uh, this, this is the app. Let me see, I should be still connected. So let's change it to a spaceship. Yeah, it's a, uh, okay, there, I've just changed the pattern to be a lightweight spaceship. Oh, I'll be darned. How about that, huh? And there's the app. Um, so is it running like uh, an operating system? Or ah, how, how did, yes. How you work with Microsoft, yeah. How's it operating? <laughs> First to your question about batteries. Yes, there's two AA batteries on the back of my badge. It's uh, tied into the Pico W, which you see right here. Huh. 
Wow, that's cool. And this is the uh, RGB unicorn pack. So the question was operating system. There is no operating system. There is no operating system. There's firmware. The firmware is MicroPython. It is Python that runs on the metal. Very cool. You still get access to a lot of the Python libraries, uh, file I.O. Remember I talked about how the, uh, the gizmo will, uh, the configuration app, when it sends a string to the device, the device writes it out into a pseudo file system somewhere in RAM, and then that's available on boot. So let's turn it off. It's off. Let's turn it on. And a glider. Oh, I'm sorry, a lightweight spaceship. So there it is. It's really easy. Like I say, uh, if you have a gadget or a gizmo or a thingamabob, you can build apps to control it very simply with Microsoft's .NET MAUI. Any, you're welcome. Thank you very much for coming to my talk. Thank you.